I'm just about to start recording the next success series. Now this week we're going to be calling a good friend of mine, Ryan Ryder. He started off at 18 years old, living in his garage or that of his family, and now a multi-millionaire. He's actually the owner of the largest chiropractor practice in all of Europe, so I can't wait. Let's get started. My name is Marcus de Maria and welcome to the success series. My guest today is Ryan Ryder, a South African born businessman who went from living in a garage at the age of just 18 to now multi-millionaire. With the odds against him, Ryan's professional career started when he became a qualified chiropractor. Now following the teachings of the great Robert Kiyosaki, Ryan learned the possibilities of earning a passive income. And today he is the co-founder of the Halza Care Group, Europe's largest private provider for physiotherapy and chiropractic care. Ryan has an incredible story to tell on how he not only achieved financial freedom for himself, but also for his family. And today we've invited him in to share with us exactly how he went from having nothing to being a multi-millionaire businessman. Everybody, Ryan Ryder. So Ryan, thank you for your time. Thanks, Marcus, thanks for having me. I'm excited to uh, dive into so hopefully, hopefully some helpful stuff. Absolutely, thank you so much. So let's dive right in. So the largest chiropractor business in Europe, I mean, what's that like? Yeah, I mean, listen, we're, a, 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 for all intents and purposes, it's a cottage industry predominantly, you know, whether you're talking about chiropractors or physiotherapists, etc. and starting Just back, so everybody knows, just explain just in one sentence, what is a chiropractor? So a chiropractor is someone that works with the body and the nervous system and helps someone function better. And predominantly we see people, most people know us as someone that helps someone with back pain and headaches and migraines and sciatica, but it's more of a lifestyle thing. You know, now, people, now we see people for all sorts of things, but they're coming to us predominantly through that means. And, right. uh, and, we, and we, you know, we try to change their minds on, you know, prevention and looking after your body long term. So uh, we see about- You're really riding that wave. I mean, that's what everybody's into. Uh, prevention, that's a, that's a big, big word. But what, what's it like being the, I know you say cottage industry, but the largest provider in all of Europe. I mean, you, that must be, I mean, I, I don't want to put words in Jim, but you must be pretty proud of that, no? Yeah, I think, I think, I think I'm, I'm, I'm proud of it coming from a background where most people are self-employed and we're going to get into that in a moment. Marcus, I think you may find a bit of a, a something in common with a lot of people you interview, it's very hard for, I don't ever go, I'm there, or I've done, this, I don't, so, so, so I certainly don't ever think that I'm there or that I've achieved amazing things yet, et cetera. I, and I do have to take stock of that at time, times and have my mentors and my coaches and people like that say, hey, so you're this is continuously well. growing. So you're continuously growing and you're, you, you, you keep wanting to achieve even though you are the largest now? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, they're just because we're the largest doesn't mean doesn't mean we haven't got opportunities to grow and do mergers and acquisitions. And by the way, by the way, talking the largest, are you the largest? But are you the best? <laughs> we would different. depends who you ask, right? But yeah, we we really think that we provide an incredible service, and um, from no one else has a team like we have, and built a built a business like we have. So we super we are proud of what we've done. Uh, but I think yeah, anyone in my position, you know, there's so much more to achieve. And um, while, I, while I'm up in the biggest, I'm still a small fish uh, in many ways in my business career. You know, I'm 36, Marcus. You know, I've, I, in many ways, I feel like I've only just begun my, my business career. So, um, so wow, I'm very wow. proud, but I've still, I've still, I feel like I've only just begun my business career, really. Wonderful. Okay, so let, let, let's start from the beginning then. So, aged 18, you're living in a garage. Yeah, so my parents um, were entrepreneurs in South Africa. If, um, I think that's my biggest blessing is I came from an entrepreneurial background. Um, they had some not so great businesses experiences. And um, they, one of the things they always provided for me was, was able to provide me was an education. So I went to a great school. I got a bursary to go to, uh, to get study chiropractic. Um, and my parents helped me through that. They immigrated well, you know, went through some challenging times financially. As I said, they immigrated across the United Kingdom to help, you know, pay for my education, etc. Went through went through chiropractic school, but I always I always knew I always I always I always thought there was a very good chance I may not practice for all that long, uh, because ultimately I was selling my time. 
I was selling okay. my time. And okay. I remember sitting, I remember sitting in, a, in a conference very early in my career, maybe had two practices. We now have nine practices very early in my career. And, I, and the speaker from stage uh, said, uh, the definition of a business is a profit-making enterprise that works without you. Oh, that, I know who that is because I read that from one of his books. That's uh, yeah. Brett, Brett, somebody or other from, from Australia, right? Uh, I, it was, it may have been Tio Becker. Okay. okay. Yeah, that's that. Um, the first time I heard that statement, and then I've been following Robert Kiyosaki for years, and he's got that cash flow quadrant, and he talks about eighty percent of the wealth is in this half, and then when I looked at it, twenty percent of the world's wealth in this half, and what half was I sitting in? I was sitting in the self-employed half, the or the self-employed. I've never, I've never had a, I've never been employed in my life, but um, I'm self-employed. So, so, so self-employed. So most people, what they do, just following the Robert Kiyosaki thing, is employed to self-employed. And then they get stuck there because they think they have a business. Yes. So you decided, oh, no, I want to move over to the other quadrant, the other side, and to actually start a business. So, how, so what did you do to do that? Yeah. Because um, a lot of people are reading these books by Robert, you know, and yeah. going, but they don't necessarily do it. So what did you do? Yeah, it's interesting. I, I was blessed to tour with Robert for three months or three weeks sorry, in Europe. And we spent a lot of meal speaking, etc. And he said to me recently, the, the journey, although he teaches this, the journey going from self-employed to business owner is the hardest thing that any specifically professional will do. Dentist, doctor, chiropractor, solicitor. It's the, because it's, it, in my experience, now I help people do this. That's another business we'll talk about in a moment. I also teach chiropractors how to do this now. But I always okay. tell everyone, if you're going to do it, it's a six-figure six pay cut initially. Okay, so you're going to earn less. Absolutely. Why? Because, you're, because you're paying somebody else to do some of the work. You're trying to hire the right people, processes, systems, yeah, procedures. Professionals earn, in, it's a, the whole golden handcuffs, if you will, from a professional is that you earn such great money and you really do earn great money. But, so, but it's time for money. Yeah. Yeah. And then you ha at some point, there's a sacrifice. I don't care what anyone tells you. The truth of it to go from self-employed to business owner is there's some point you have to decide, look, I can see the future. I have to sacrifice that and move myself out of seeing the, the patients, the, the clients, and then moving a business to do it. And there's absolutely a short term pay cut. Right. So, the, you know, I've never heard it that way. This is awesome. So, so you basically take a short term pay cut. Yeah. Um, but my question now would probably be, or anybody's question now, I guess, is for how long? Uh, it just be, depends how aggressive you are and aggressive. how much you want to scale. Yeah, aggressive. And, I, and aggressive in a, in a non kind of like negative way, but really pushing to get the right people, processes, procedures t together and the systems. Yeah, I think the, most, the reason most people never move from self-employed to business is because they're too comfortable. So you have to create some pain. You have to go, oof, you know, I was earning six figures and now I'm down to whatever it is. You pay yourself a salary. I mean, I know when I did it, Marcus, we paid my... Oh, paid you were myself. paying yourself six figures at the time. You had two and you were paying yourself, what was six figures? I was earning six-figure income because I was the person, I was the professional seeing the customers as the chiropractor. Yeah. Then yeah. you've got to go, okay, right, I'm no longer going to be the person seeing the whether I'm a dentist, doctor, chiropractor, I'm, my team's going to do that. And you but don't they want you, though? Don't they want you? I mean, it wasn't the Ryan Ryder uh, company, right? So, so that's already – because that's a mistake some people do. They use their name, and then people always want you. Yeah, Marcus, you such a great point. And I always joke, you know, never put your name across. If you that type of thing, you can never scale out of it. Yeah. And there's, there's lots we can go into now. I've learned a little bit more about branding. I've, I've learned that you can be the brand as well as not be the person seeing the person. Actually, it was a mistake I made in the early in the early uh, early parts. Um, yeah, but to scale, when I say aggressive, hire. Are you going to hire the team? Can you hire the team? Can you do the marketing to feed that team? so that you can then eventually replace your income with the business making an income and not you earning the income. So let, let's talk stuff. about you then. So, so in terms of you like hiring this people, were you, were you aggressive, first of all? Yeah. I mean, you, we, we're I, not, you're not, you don't seem as if you're aggressive. Yeah, but aggressive? We, we're tagline. The tagline was always be hiring. Always be hiring. Always. But you can't hire everybody. No, but um, especially if you're working in a niche where you've got professionals, the resource is the limiter to the business, i.e. there's only so many solicitors, there's only so many chiropractors, there's only so many physiotherapists. If you're hiring an HR person, I mean, at the moment, let's give you an example, I'm hiring an operations person in one of my business, and I've got hundreds of CVs to get through. It's not a challenge. If I'm hiring for a, a videographer or I'm hiring for a marketing manager, it's hundreds upon hundreds of people applying at the moment. 
But mm-hmm. if I'm hiring for a chiropractor, dentist, doctor, it's you're getting trickles of CVs coming oh, through. So, so in, in, in key positions, then, so it's not everybody, in key positions, always be hiring. So uh, proactively hiring, and when you see somebody, talk to them because they might be leaving right now, or they might be, you know, they don't want to do their own business. So always be proactive. Oh, okay, that's really good. That's really good. Okay. So, so, so you did that, and then were you ever disappointed? Like, like, like I think people go from self-employed, and then they go, okay, I'll hire somebody, and then it's just like, oh, bloody hell, they either steal or they 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 they, they, they open up in competition opposite you, or you know, you just go ah, and then you go back to being self-employed, no? Yeah, many times, <laughs> many times. Of course, that's part of the journey, you know. Everyone wants everyone wants the success. Part of the journey. Them. Well, okay. Yeah. It's part of the journey. Are people going to try open up down the road? Yes, it's part of the journey, and um, and then you learn from it. So it's not it's not that it happens; it's that don't let it happen again. So then you you get your your systems correct, and oh man, I know the that contracts and make sure you manage them properly and all of this. So you think it's a learning you have to go to through, but 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 I think it's good that they know that beforehand, right? Because I think most people don't. So hiring always, you know, be aggressive hiring continuously, uh, and, and you're, you're expect to things to go wrong. And you're going to suck at hiring in the beginning. You've had no practice with it. Like, you know, you haven't done core values before. You haven't got a gut feel before. And also, you get a bit, I say in a good way, you get a bit grumpier as you've been in business. I've been running practices for 10 years now. And yeah. by grumpier, I mean, in an interview, you feel a bit more confident saying, look, I, I, I'm a nightmare to work with with this, this, and this. And don't expect this, this, this. Are you sure you want the position? So now, uh, first time, in the beginning, I was like trying to coach people to come with. Now I'm trying to like almost scare them away and go like, are you sure? Are you sure you, you want to work with me? As you grow, right? As you grow. Yeah. And you just and get you hire the people. bright people. As we used to just hire people who had a pulse. Literally, if they were there, we go. Yeah, they're not. They're not bad. So let let's yeah. get them. You know, mistake upon mistake upon mistake. Nightmare. Yeah. Very I, I, I don't know why. I know it's a cliche, but you just not the speed thing is important, Marcus, because you uh, even the way you're talking is you're not going to get it right. Like, don't try to get it right. You're going to make a mistake. And you've got mentors and stuff to help you. But the speed thing's important because you might have made three mistakes while someone else is contemplating making their first. But you've got it right. So, like, just hurry up and make the mistakes. You're going to make them anyway. So, your choice is, are you going to make them over, over six years or are you going to make them over six months? And make them as, as quickly as possible is, is, is what you're saying. So, you said something about everybody has mentors, everybody has coaches. Uh, do they? Um, everyone that has got mentors and coaches um, uh, will obviously have shortcuts from them. And, okay. um, and, and that's an important part. I frequently had any one time have more, more than, I've always got more than one coach, always. Does it have, does it have to be, well, uh, most successful people do. Um, but if you think you can't afford a coach, I think you can't afford not to. But let's say you think that you can't. Is there any other way of getting coaching and mentoring? <laughs> are there um, courses online? Are there books? Or did you not rate those as much? Um, um, listen, uh, uh, well, a mutual friend of ours always says, actually, um, that um, where would you start? He's like, read a book. Where else mm. would you start? I mean, everyone, everyone I know that's successful in anything, you know, they've read the books. Marcus, we've sat down in many, many rooms together. And the first conversation, what are you reading at the moment? I'm reading this, I'm reading that. And, yeah. and we bounce off each other. And then, yeah. Okay, what are you reading? What are you reading? Um, at the moment, uh, actually, Jordan Peterson, 12 rule, 12. Yeah. I haven't started reading it, but uh, that's, that's, my cool. next, that's my next yeah, read. You see, it's very cool. Yeah, that's my next read that I want to get through at the moment. And he's been through a very, very challenging year, which is interesting. Um, but he's my, he's my favorite person to listen to online at the moment. So, so, so to come back to, so Robert Kiyosaki says, going from being self-employed to being a business owner is the toughest thing you do. Is there any dot, 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 but it is worth it? I mean, is there anything at the end of that sentence? <laughs> I think you really got to know yourself. Um, what I mean by that, I don't think everyone should own a business. Ooh. I, I okay. really don't. Sometimes I, I really don't. Sometimes the person is going to make enough. No, say that again. Something's happened to the audio. Something's happened to your audio. Your audio's gone. Keep talking. Yeah, it's totally gone. You got me now? You got me? Yes, yes, yes. So let's go back to that. Um, So just pretend I asked you that question and just say, I don't think most people should. Okay. Okay, so I don't think everyone should own a business. Really? 
Your audio's hey. gone. Your audio's gone. Audio's gone. I can't believe it. Yeah, it's gone. You're echoing. You're like, it's not. That's me. That's me. I don't know why these keep on connecting. Keep on uh, going to uh, my that's ear. Better. That's better. That's yeah, better. Okay. It should be fine. It should be fine now. Let's go to that question. Put them out the window for so, a second. Um, All right. So you're about to uh, say anybody should open up. Uh, yeah. I'm just going to put them in. Because they keep on going. Sorry. Can, can you hear me now? Yes. No, 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 no. Can you hear can me? You, can you, can you maybe me? Can go you me? Can you put me? them in another room or something? I don't know. This is what I have to deal with. You know, I have to deal with amateurs here. How many now? <laughs> yeah, that's good. We're good? Are we good? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, let's okay. go on. on. Yeah, yeah. Okay, dot, dot, dot. So, I mean, is it worth it? It's definitely worth it depending on your personality type. And what I mean by that, I don't think that everyone should automatically think that owning a business is the right thing for them. Okay. But should they try? Not everyone. Really? Yeah, I do think that. I do think sometimes going from self-employed, I've seen that there are some individuals that earn enough money at the self-employed that their route, their route to financial freedom is quicker going from self-employed to investor as opposed to self-employed. Yeah. So. Now, I would agree with you uh, on that, of course, since you are now in my quadrant, uh, the investor <laughs> quadrant. But this is really interesting. But I guess yeah. if they want to keep doing it, they'll be unhappy because they think they're missing out. And I think, you know, maybe they should get to know themselves and just say, do you know what? I can make better money being self-employed and investing. How do you know, though? Um, I think uh, for me, okay, so this is my thing, okay? For me, when I look at my schedule, two weeks ahead of time, one week at time, and it's busy, I feel trapped. If you tell me I have to be somewhere Monday at 9 a.m. every single, like if I have a shift pattern, like a chiropractor might work every single wow. Monday, they work from eight or whatever. If, I, if, you, if, you, if you show me a schedule like that, I'm, I, I feel completely claustrophobic. I don't, want, I don't want to see anything in my diary, really. I don't want what? to see multiple back-to-back -back diaries. Um, and actually, I learned, when, I, when I heard um, Warren Buffett um, Bill Gates said the biggest thing you learned from Warren Buffett was that Warren Buffett's got like nothing in his diary. <laughs> and you think Warren Buffett would be back to back. He's like, no, Warren Buffett's got, he hasn't got back to back nothing. He's like, you can, you can see his diary. And I learned a great line. And it was, you know, whenever, whenever someone wants to meet with you and they're like, can we book it two weeks ahead of time? Warren Buffett always just says, phone me, phone me that week or phone me the day before and see if, and if I'm available, I'll do it. And no one ever does. So, so then what happens is, wow. Yeah, you get then you look at your diary and and you are you are a slave to everyone else's diary. Well, I'm I'm a slave to my diary for for, for sure. I yeah. yeah, I need to get a lot better at uh, at saying no to people for sure, for sure. But that's just my personality. I just feel trapped. I just feel trapped when I if you had to tell me I have to be somewhere every single Tuesday from eight till five. That's just my personality. Um, from that, so so for me going. Oh, okay, to but eight or five. But what about things like you know you have meetings every Tuesday for a couple of hours? Is that okay? Yeah, you have to have that. You have to have that. Um, from that perspective, I'm still not. I'll be honest, I'm still not great at that. But I have a team that, for instance, um, if you follow the great, uh, fantastic book called Traction. Traction. Yeah, and it's by Gina Wickman. And, um, and it talks about the visionary in the business is the only person in the business that doesn't necessarily have to be at every single meeting. The visionary. Yeah, the visionary. And there's a visionary and the integrator. And the visionary needs to know, you need to know yourself and be free. You're going to go and have coffee and you're going to think and you're going to, you know, have you conversations. Speak with things, do joint ventures and go uh, out there. Yeah. But the integrator of the business needs to know themselves and be stressed. And that's a tough conversation you have when you're hiring, when you're hiring that integrator slash general manager slash operations, it's like your job is to be stressed so that the, the markets, if you're the visionary of your business, the business's best asset is for you to be free. Do you know, that's really interesting because just the other day, John, our general manager said, do you know what? I need to hire a, 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 a PA for you, an executive PA. You're going to have to pay quite a lot, he said, who runs your entire life. I want to totally free you up because yeah. we need you there. He, that's what he said. And I was like, well, that sounds good. Yeah. You know? 
Amazing. All right, let's. Um, I hope people learned from that. I certainly did. There, there were a lot of different points there. I want to. I want to say this. Can I add one, one tiny point there? Yes, often, yes. Often the people, and I know I suffer this a lot. And it talks about it in the book is when you get there, often the biggest thing we suffer with is guilt as the business owner. Because we're so taught that you need to lead from the front. And if, for instance, a new computer system, I, I deal with small business owners all the time and, and they'll say, well, I can't expect my team to learn the Vida notes. I'm like, no, that's a terrible idea. <laughs> you, you, you're gonna be terrible at that. Don't do that. Or how can I expect, no, that's not the, that's your best, you, you can't be the goalkeeper, the striker and the defender. So if you're the striker, go be striker, you know, yeah. and go do that. So sometimes yeah, because while you're defending, you won't be able to to, to score the goal for sure. So okay, very good. Stops us, yeah. I think it's worth for people to be taking lots of notes here and maybe even watch the interview again. Um, people tend to make excuses around obstacles to success. Now you're obviously successful. What are your views on that? Um, I think I think um, business is a best. I think business is the best personal development program you'll ever take, um, because you're going to have really hard days, and you're going to have, you know. Um, I remember someone standing up in a conference once, and they said to Blair Singer, uh, who's a rich dad advisor, and they said, yeah. Blair, I just want to be in a business where I wake up every day and I just love life and everything. Like I'm just on purpose all the time, and I just. And he's like, well, and he's, I never forget his response. And he said, well, you're going to have another thing coming because in every business you have to, and his words were, forgive my language, you have to eat a shit sandwich every day in some way, shape or form. Um, so like, so yeah, business is hard. Business is hard. And that kind of segues back to the initial question is sometimes I feel that when, a, when someone, a high earning individual, a star is making such good money that their quickest way to financial freedom when they are not relying on that income is investing, whether it's property or investments, et cetera, just, just knowing yourself from that perspective. But from a business perspective, it's hard. Any, any, any income generating things hard. Mm -mm -mm. I mean, your business being self-employed, you're gonna eat that shit sandwich, right? You, you, you have to. But then again, you also just said that if you're the leader, the visionary, then you need to take yourself outside of that and not eat so many shit sandwiches and just feed them to your general manager. Is that what you're saying? It's different, it's different shit sandwich. So the, it's the, different. It tastes different. It's, it's a different shit sandwich. Listen, the more success okay. we get, the bigger the challenges. So all of a sudden, the shit sandwich at there is big finance questions big problem solving questions, big relationship issues, if you will, within, within the organizations, um, big joint venture, raising finance. Those, those become the big shit sandwiches you have to eat then. It never ends. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. I just, I, everyone watching this right now, I don't mean this to be a, I, I don't mean this to be like a, oh my word, why would I do it? The reason we do it is because we grow more than anyone on the planet because we put ourselves in the position where we are constantly trying to solve problems. But it's not smooth. Gee whiz, it's, it's hard work and there's, it, does, it just changes. So, I mean, what I'm hearing here, and everyone says this, I don't know whether they really believe it, but 80% you know, of success really truly is mindset. So do you believe that? Yeah, absolutely. I think... I think um, <laughs> I'll go back to a statement we have said many times together, Marcus, is that 80% of the secret to success is to show up. What's actually what I thought you were going to say, and to show up, you need to have a good mindset. <laughs> because yeah. you've got to wake to up. Keep and showing up. To keep showing up, even when those shit, shit sandwiches are being shoveled down your throat. Yeah, and it's not if, it's when. And, and that, that means that I don't want you to get, I want, if only one thing business owners get from this is for them to go, oh, I'm normal. Oh, oh, it's normal to get down on the odd morning. Oh, it's normal to have a challenge in business. Yeah, it's normal. Like, get on. Like, welcome to the club. You know? Yeah, absolutely. So, so what do you do to, to help you become more successful in terms of mindset? What do you do? I think hang around the right uh, environment is stronger than willpower. Environment is stronger than willpower. So I like to um, hang around with people that push me and, and keep me, you know, striving. Uh, for other ideas. And I don't know if you know, um, to give you an example, I recently had dinner with someone and I don't know if you know this, but um, if you're a 5 million pounds, so we turn over 5 million pounds and above, if we're over 5 million pound company, you're top 1% of all companies 
It's five million dollars actually. I think uh, you're top one one percent of all companies on the planet, or in US, top one percent, right? And I remember someone said that, "Wow, Ryan, you've done really well." And the other person at the table is a ten mil, and he's and he said, "I I don't even want to talk about that because I don't want to. I don't even want anyone to even begin to let me let us feel like we've achieved masses yet because we've only just started our career. We're both very young. We were both under thirty five, um, and it was a real lesson for me. It was like, okay, great, like don't put the feather in the cap too early and and things like that because it's about achieving not financial always just learning new challenges to solve and can you be the person can you grow as the person that can hold that space of 10 million 20 million whatever yeah 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 do you think it's a big because you're now at what five million so is your next goal 10 million um actually my goals have changed slightly in that um uh, what they say, turnover is turnover is vanity, profit is sanity. So, um, so actually, I've pivoted into um, informational consulting about two years ago in that business, and then I've continued to build the bring the build the assets. So, I've got multiple property uh, um, projects on at the moment. So, that's probably more of my goal is um, is is profits with aspect perspective. But we are looking at acquisition targets also. Ah, acquisition targets. So that this is you being the visionary, and because uh, you just said about you know acquisitions and and all this sounds very very good. So um, I, as you know, I'm a man of trading and investing. So I'm in the I quadrant very much. Okay. So so tell me, what do you do? You're you're into wealth, right? Yes. Do you invest? Yes. Okay. So, so we, we predominantly real estate. Real estate. Now you said predominantly. Yeah. Is there anything else you do? Yeah, um, you know, I am um, through through a lot of your stuff, Marcus, and being involved in that world. I had one strategy that I did was, a little, and I won't even go into because it it's so basic. But it's really, uh, I would just buy a little bit of oil at one point, and that was with a lot of help from uh, from uh, you know it's your circles. But I just tick along with that. But I didn't. It's all it's all property really, and then business, property and business. Um, People often ask me, why don't I invest more? It's only one question. I'm uneducated when it comes to stocks and trading at a high level. So I won't talk about it um, much. But when it comes to property investing, that's my big push at the moment. Uh, what, about, but what, about, what about cryptocurrencies? Have you heard about that recently? <laughs> yeah, I have. So um, I'm in my process of learning and, and studying and getting, and getting education in that at the moment. Oh, you are? Yes. You are, are you? you should I am, go. I am, I am, I am. Do you know what I, you know what I watched recently, Marcus? I watched a brilliant interview and it was through a podcast. Listen through uh, Robert Kiyosaki put me onto a podcast with two young guys, and, uh, and you might know it, but they spoke about and it was an it was a open letter to Ray Dalio, mm -hmm. who recently came out and criticized um, crypto. And okay. uh, it was, if you want an education on fiscal um, history and currency and how, um, and, and how a really crypto is going to be the new gold, et cetera, and silver, or it was... Was it the me, Winklevoss twins? Was it them? They, they, they tend to do stuff like that. Yeah, it was just, it was just brilliant. If you type into, type into um, YouTube, Ray Dalio. Ray Dalio open let, uh, response to Ray Dalio open letter, it was yeah. absolutely brilliant. And... Um, and it was more the history of how all fiscal currency eventually is going to enter zero, if you will. Yeah, I think and the average is 94 years, I, I believe, and, and that cycle is very much upon us. Um, yeah. Robert Kiyosaki, since you, you, you do, you're a fan, I mean, he's, he's, he's quite a grumpy person, I find, you know. Um, but anyway, he doesn't like a lot of things or people, um, and he doesn't suffer fools gladly. So he's very much into real estate, of course. But recently, what he's been talking about a lot is, you know, get in, save yourself, get into gold and silver. And, and I was gobsmacked, cryptocurrencies. And, and if, I, I was... If you watch the, if you watch the interview, it's, he directly references that interview as, as why. And, and when you watch it, you really, for me, as an uneducated crypto person, when I watch the spend, I think it's 40 minutes or an hour, but it'll completely educate yourself on, obviously, within reason, on the history. It's more when you understand the history of, of depreciation and, 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 um, and where, where, finance, where all finance eventually goes, that I was like, oh, my word, I've really got to learn about this. So, yeah. Well, let's talk off the interview about um, your crypto club. 
because we have everything in there that you need, everything. So, and, and it's really important, you know, Mac and his, his whole family are in it. Yes. Um, Alex, Alex Mandosian. Yes. Um, and uh, uh, Sandra. And um, I tell you, it is extremely profitable and extremely exciting. I know you shouldn't get too excited about these things, but, but you know, it's supposed to be non-emotional. <laughs> um, do, do, do you get emotional when it comes to sort of, like investing? Or do you just do it? It's just a system and you just keep going. You just keep going. You just keep going. I mean, it's impossible to say we don't get emotional about it. Um, with, uh, for me, my biggest reference for that is property. And then I do get I do get excited when I think of, you know, the refinance and pulling all the money out and then the deal. And um, yeah, you get super excited. And um, I am, I think the, the key thing with what's just been, I've always been good at cash generating. I've always been pretty good at, at earning a living and making money and you know why, why do you think that is by the way why why i think at that phase um i always say i'm, I'm i always say I'm, I'm really great at zero to a million I'm, i can i feel i can take any business to a million uh, mm. and then and then and then from there systems take over and structure and bigger thinking but zero to a million is all about energy to answer your question why do you think of it it's like can i can, can i just go out there i'll do whatever it takes you know but at some point you need a bit more strategy and etc so i'm really good at that initial phase and, and I guess one to five is different. And then the next one, five to 10, I, is something totally different. I actually think one to 10 is about the same. And it's, uh, and it's pain. Yeah. It's pain. And what I mean by that is um, you one to one, zero to one is like almost your most profitable. And then there comes a tipping point. So then it's economies of scale. And well, if you're a multi you have to invest more, invest more, but then you can get yourself out of it and actually create a business. So again, it's, it creates a sellable business. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Wow. Okay. So hold on. Let's quickly go into that. So first of all, so it is worth it for the right person to yeah. then take that dip, but yes. to be paying other people so that you can get out, yes. but not get out, but become yes. the visionary that really builds it and works on the business. Yes. Um, and then it'll be maybe less profitable percentage wise, but you'll be making more money. And then you have a sellable business. Is that what I'm hearing? You have a sellable business. And then you've also given yourself the biggest commodity in the, or the, the most precious commodity in the world, which is time. So then you can do the investing. And then you wow. can do the, the property. So then you, you're increasing multiple sources of income. Now, my pains is that um, I, my family, you know, through the entrepreneurial journey they went through, they had two bankruptcies. Okay. So okay, I. Wow. I I operate in a way that it's not that if I had to lose any one major source of income, I need to still be okay. Well, and it has I, to be two. They went twice. So, so you need at least three. So no, they, least but they always had one source. So it was two different times. So I always only had one source of income. So they okay. had clothing stores, right? The clothing stores did really, really well. Uh, we had a, I'm sure you know, Garden Home Magazine. We are home was in that and we did very well financially and then that went sour and then that another business was a chain of restaurants and then that went sour and i guess my lesson from it and whether mm. it's right or wrong it's my journey is um is that their business is quite fragile i mean look at this lockdown how many how many mm. businesses so so you know is yeah. it, what about focus on the other hand as well you know like because, yeah. because if you do too many things so that it's it's like you're saying do two or three yes but also don't spread yourself too thinly, surely. Yes, you're right. And I have, like every entrepreneur, made that mistake. <laughs> yeah. So how many things do you actually concentrate on? So there's your, ah. there's your business, then just that, that other business that you said, and then there's real estate. So is it mainly three? Yes, and within some of those, there's also offshoots. So let me run through it. So I, I believe this was taught to me, we both know very well, by Dan Kennedy, who's probably my most, I've probably read more of his content than any other entrepreneur just about. So he I, could be classed as one of your mentors. Massive. Well, I, yeah, and, I, and I've paid for his masterminds and okay. spent many, much time with, uh, with Dan in a room. And, um, and he always says that every person has a business and an information business in them. So they've got a business, the thing that they do, let's say chiropractor, physio, dentist, and then they also have an information business in them, specifically if they're successful. If they're successful at this, there's a whole bunch of other people that could benefit from your knowledge, what he calls an information business. Um, and, and many of the greats came from his masterminds, Frank Kern, Ryan Dice, Russell Brunson. They're all Dan students, you know? So, yeah. so they all came from that. So I did the same and, and that's just another source of income. And then I took those profits and one of my limited companies, I take, I don't take a cent out of the limited company. I just, 
put it back into prop into property. So that becomes a cash cow for me to put into assets again. Yeah, that's like a a, a, a kind of a a pension, if you like. Yes. Um, but it also generates cash, which most pensions yeah. don't, I guess, right? Correct. That's fantastic. So to finish this off, then. Yes. Are you open to me teaching you about how to invest in cryptos? I'm always open to that. I, in fact, I wouldn't have been researching it if I wasn't, and I know that I need to pull the trigger. So yes, sir, I am. Awesome. awesome. Well, you, you're at the right time. So thank you so much for your time. I think people should uh, immediately grab a piece of paper and a pen and watch this entire interview again, because there were some real golden nuggets there that I think everybody can use. So thank you so much, Ryan. Thank you for your time. Thanks for awesome being here and uh, thanks for all the work you do and all the people you help. Thank you.